good riddance to it. We're going to look ahead uh, to prospects for housing markets in uh, 2022. And in particular, we're focusing today on the most powerful force driving real estate markets around the nation so far in the 21st century, which is the one we call the exodus to affordable lifestyle. For several years, Australians have been exiting the big cities and moving their lives to smaller cities and to regional areas. And these locations have been outperforming the bigger cities on capital growth for a number of years. So as we contemplate 2022, the key question is whether this trend is going to continue. And to provide the answers, I'm joined today by Tim Graham from Reventon. Tim, welcome. Sorry, great to see you. And how are things? Oh, very good. Um, we're very busy uh, for good reasons, and I'm pretty sure you are as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we're just off the back of three record months, actually. It's um, been an incredible 2021. I think um, everybody's uh, down here in Melbourne, we've just been let out on good behaviour. So we're enjoying fruits of our labour, but also being able to get out and enjoy it for a change. Yeah. So perhaps before we uh, get into the nitty gritty of today's topic, perhaps you could just uh, tell us a little bit about Reventon and who you are and what you do. Sure thing. Uh, so Reventon, our uh, head, head office is here on um, St Kilda Road in Melbourne, but we are a national business uh, established in 2005. Uh, essentially what we are is a holistic financial services business. So we have everything that you'd need for, um, you know, for, to grow a portfolio, um, everything from mortgage breaking through to property investment buyers advocacy, and then all the services in between, which including uh, accounting, financial planning, property management, and uh, we basically bundle the whole thing together under one roof. Um, I guess what people really like about that is that um, the left hand knows what the right hand's doing all the time. So rather than shooting off in 100 different directions, you can call a 1300 number or come into our office here in St Kilda Road, you know, the time permits. And, um, and, and I suppose the you know, permits and things like that are allowing us to get back out and see people again. You can get everything done under the one roof um, and nice and quick. So, yeah, it's yeah. been good. Now, um, as I said, you're the, the ideal guest to talk about today's topic, which is, is about the the exodus to affordable lifestyle and, and whether we think it's going to continue in 2022 and beyond, because I know that your business has been very much immersed in that trend. I think you're probably one of the first businesses um, in the real estate space to pick up on that trend uh, some years ago, and you've very much been operating uh, in that way for some time. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what probably brought that, that on, if you go back sort of you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, typical mum and dad investor, you know, if they thought about investing in real estate, and mind you, this is back when interest rates are seven and eight percent, all they could sort of afford was that four hundred to five hundred thousand dollar bracket, which um, most people just assumed. Oh, I go and buy a, an apartment a couple of k's from the CBD, and um, now that didn't seem to work all that well. We had uh, huge approval rates uh, for new build going up in all the capital cities with a, a big influx of international investment, so we could see a big supply um, hitting the market. And we thought, you know, this is where a lot of people are going to get caught out. That you get uh, caught up as a number, and typically we don't see that growth in apartments for that reason. So whilst I think some markets have changed, um, certainly at that time for us, we thought there's got to be a better way, and that's when we started to look at the um, you know the affordable lifestyle style um, options at um, you know, regional areas all around Australia. So um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the areas that we focused on throughout the presentation. But for us, it was about getting better bang for buck um, um, back then. So, you know, for the same type of um, budget, we could get a four bedroom home and a big block um, renting, you know, dollar per thousand. So that made more sense to us. Yeah. One of the things I'd like to do today right at the beginning is, is kind of um, put to bed this, um, the myth that's out there and, and media kind of has misrepresented this trend as something that's a response to COVID-19 and lockdowns. But uh, I think you and I both know that this, this trend of people exiting the bigger cities, moving to the smaller cities and the regional areas has been underway for much, much longer than that. Absolutely. Um, I think there's probably merit to what some of the media's um, speculation is on people moving to the regional areas throughout COVID some might return. And I think there probably is an element of that. Um, but that's certainly not what's been driving it over the last 10 years. Um, and that's why, why we call it the, um, you know, the flight to affordability. People are choosing to not only live in um, a place that's worth, you know, they can downsize their mortgage from a million dollars to, to half a million dollars and get a you know, much bigger home, maybe a bit more land, certainly better lifestyle for, for a lot of families, um, you know, the bigger backyards and things like that. And um, that's been driving that for, you know, as long as I've been working in real estate. 
Um, but yeah, and certainly in more recent times, we've seen a lot more people who are able to work from home uh, and have that flexibility not to have to travel to you know, a CBD office and work from the comfort of their own home. They're choosing to do that in a you know, more comfortable environment. And I think yeah. um, you know, areas like South East Queensland are certainly seeing really strong trends uh, that would support that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the, the numbers show that you know, Sydney, for example, has been losing population to what we call internal migration, which is people moving to other parts of Australia for, for 10 years, in fact, and, and Melbourne in significant numbers for about the past four to five years. Mm. And um, where we at Hotspotting first really noticed the trend was actually in those um, strong regional cities um, just outside of Melbourne, um, you know, over the last sort of four to five years, we've seen um, places like Geelong and Ballarat in particular rise very strongly as a result of this trend. And I know these are markets that you've been uh, very active in with your clients uh, over Edmonton. Yeah, absolutely. But the, um, you know, there's a lot of things that um, have driven that outside of affordability and lifestyle, certainly, you know, big infrastructure booms and things in those regions. Uh, supported, but not only Victoria. I mean, um, Newcastle in um, New South Wales is obviously another one back in a similar time that we were focusing on Geelong, even maybe even a little earlier than that. Um, that those sort of markets have been taking a little bit away from the, the capital cities like your Sydney. Um, but then other um, other areas around um, around Australia, like um, Queensland, that have been attracting people just purely on on lifestyle. You know, they they want to be able to live near the beach. They want the warmer climate. All those types of factors. Um, obviously, for um, Queensland, for a long time, they had the mining boom as well. So people moving for jobs. So as we have observed it, initially, it was very much about people uh, moving to regional areas close to their capital city. But it seems to me that it's, it, it's, 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 it's rippled out. It's, it's gravitated further and further afield. And we're now seeing markets um, a greater distance from the big cities uh, being pumped up by this trend. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's funny, the, the old saying when you're looking to buy real estate, you buy it as close to as a capital city as possible. But um, if you think about it, not just in um, the more recent trends with, um, with the pandemic, but people uh, are choosing to live as close to work as possible, but not everybody's traveling into um, you know, a capital city CBD. There's a lot of CBDs popping up outside of that. Certainly here in Melbourne in the southeast, there's a reason the southeast, um, southeast and suburbs stretch that far. You've got big um, you know, CBDs like the Monash um, precinct, which are huge employment hubs. So now that's a, you know, a long way away from the, the capital city. And I know, you know certainly in other markets like um, um, Sydney and you've got you know, little satellite cities outside of that as well. Now, it's not really the capital city so much now that are driving um, you know, a, a lot of the, the population um, to live um, there just for work. Yeah, uh, Tim, I think it's one of the greatest myths in real estate that um, everybody works in, in that CBD, yeah. the Melbourne CBD. Right. I mean, the, the numbers actually show that um, in terms of jobs, about 20% of the jobs in Melbourne are in the city of Melbourne. That's the city of Melbourne local government area, which includes the CBD in the near city suburbs. Mm -hmm. That means 80% of the jobs in Melbourne are actually out in suburban job nodes, like some of the ones you've mentioned. And that's true also for Sydney. It's true for Brisbane. Um, some some of the, the absolute um, big biggest jobs nodes are, are out there in the suburbs. And so for many people, there, there isn't any um, pressing need to actually, when it comes to buying a home, to actually be close to the CBD. That's right. Well, we've seen the last 12 months that um, you know, big businesses uh, are choosing you know, not to bring people back into their offices. You know, um, there's a lot of companies that have gone and you know sold down. Uh, I've got uh, a, a, well, not an ex colleague, but a, a, a guy that I've known for a long time who runs a similar business to us. And um, in the last 12 months, he just decided to shut down his Sydney office. And in the money that he was saving from um, from closing down that uh, office, he ended up um, investing all of that into technology. So he's, everything he's used to be able to do in an office, he can do online now. And I think it's money well spent. A lot of businesses are trending that way. And it means for their employees, they've got a um, you know, much more flexible arrangement for their work. It might be that they're only going into the office a couple of days a week and they're not commuting and sitting in traffic every, um, every day for three hours. Yeah, and well, one of the things uh, we've noticed and one of the reasons why we think this trend is longevity is that um, some of the um, online jobs platforms are increasingly offering work from home as an option. Um, that flexibility has been offered to attract in employees uh, by more and more businesses. Um, I think LinkedIn was an example with a percentage of uh, job offers that had that as part of the offer as uh, zoomed in the last 12 months. 
Yeah, it's been widely documented globally that um, that people are, you know, that's one of the biggest preferences when they're looking for employment. Uh, certainly a big study in the US recently that there was something um, like 40% of uh, people that were within a job had intentions to leave that job within the, um, within the next 12 months to try to find something that offered that um, you know, work-life balance. Um, people aren't, you know, I think what the pandemic has taught people is it's not all about work anymore and they you know, want to spend more time with family. They don't want to be sitting in traffic all day. And um, you know, this is something that employers uh, are going to have to get used to and have to adapt to if they want to you know, acquire good talent and keep them. Yeah, and I think um, the other thing is that a lot of employers have actually found this does work. But, uh, it doesn't yeah. suit everybody, but there certainly are, there are some people who have found that they can actually be more productive uh, for the yeah. employers um, working that way. Um, as I say, not everybody, but um, it's sort of working at both ends. Um, employers mm -hmm. finding um, their, some of their workforce anyway more productive, but also saving on their office costs. Um, oh, absolutely. Um, I can tell you, for us, we've grown, um, you know, we've grown significantly throughout the pandemic and we, we wouldn't be able to get everybody back into the office even if we wanted to now uh, without you know, knocking down walls and things like that and having to take over other leases. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a good problem to have when um, you know, we have to have staff working from home now. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's something that we can still monitor. Everything, our clients are still uh, satisfied with the level of service they're getting and it means that we don't have to go having these uh, enormous costs of new, uh, new buildings and knocking down walls. Okay, so Tim, I know you've got um, a presentation to do today with, with um, some slides, so now might be a good time for you to uh, share your screen and, and talk us through some of that information. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I suppose to kick things off, Terry, um, obviously the, the topic today was uh, around the exodus to these regional areas, but a lot of this is what they've been referring to as the Great Migration. So um, March 2021, the ABS data shows that capital cities had a net loss of nearly 12,000 people in just one quarter. So that's the largest one on record. Um, Melbourne, no surprise, losing 8,300. Uh, and Brisbane gaining a net 3,300. Um, Queensland for that um, year to date to March 2021 gained 43,900 people. Um, and obviously this is not only having an effect in the way that people are, are thinking about um, that, um, they're, where they're living, but also where they're investing. So 44% of uh, respondents in a, re a recent survey of property investors said that they would be open to inter um, investing interstate, which is actually a, a huge increase on previous years. And that's obviously because they're not only seeing that with their feet as they're choosing to live in other places, but certainly in the way that they're investing. So today, with that being the, the topic of uh, discussion, as um, we spoke about during the week, uh, what I have prepared is a little bit uh, for our, uh, the, the viewers here today, uh, how we go uh, using data like this and, and understanding these trends, how do we start to utilise some of those smarts when we're trying to find areas to invest in? So I know a lot of people would be familiar with the, the property clock. Um, and the property clock is obviously uh, very important to that targeting the right areas because obviously we know property uh, markets around the country are very cyclical. Um, and what we're trying to achieve when we're looking at um, uh, the property clock is we really want to be aiming for the, the nine o'clock. Uh, a lot of people have talked about trying to buy at the seven o'clock. My concern with buying at the seven o'clock, which is the start of a recovery or, or a real emerging market, is um, that seven o'clock to nine o'clock might represent two hours on um, the property clock, but it can actually turn out to be many, many years. Um, and what I mean by that is buying into areas where you are waiting for infrastructure, you are waiting for all of these um, you know, school zones to open, all these types of things, it can actually store your capital growth. So I have, you know, I have people talk to me a lot about, oh, what about this area, what about that area? And a lot of the time I say, yeah, I, I do like that area. Um, Springfield's a great example um, in Queensland. Uh, I watched that market for eight years before we decided to jump in there. And it was because I was waiting for a lot of these infrastructure to open. And by the time we clicked going in that first you know, 12 months, we saw about 12% worth of uplift. So it is about timing the market right. And the way that we do that, uh, I'll just uh, zoom in a bit on this again. So we use this golden cycle. So we look for you know, infrastructure booms. And there's plenty of that happening, especially off the back of this um, pandemic, where state governments are really you know, trying to create jobs. Okay, so there's a lot of infrastructure being um, brought forward. That's creating jobs, that's increasing population and in um, 
uh, flow and effect of that population and job growth is also capital growth on your properties. So we have a bit of a formula that helps us with that. We call it the PIED um, uh, formula, which is a, a checklist that we go through, which is the population growth. We look at the infrastructure spending. We look at the employment node uh, to make sure the local economy is very strong. And the next part about that economy is we're looking at um, diversity within the economy. So ensuring that we're not looking at um, you know, markets that are just propped up by one thing. Um, you know, we've certainly seen areas around Australia in the last decade where um, you know, they might have been propped up by an LNG mine or they might have been propped up by you know, tourism and then all of a sudden we have a pandemic or we have the government changing policy and all of a sudden these houses that are getting huge rental yields and have jumped up in price in the last couple of years are now hard to rent and then also lost their, uh, their value. So it's really important that we're looking not only at what's uh, um, how, how strong the local economy is but obviously how diverse it is as well. The next thing um, that we talk about when we look at um, this um, re the regional areas is we look at the, um, them from a price perspective, right? If we can get into the property market between that sort of 450 to 600 bracket, that's also where we find the sweet spot in the rental yield. Okay, so these are just some examples um, that we found in recent times, and there's some um, uh, the the most recent um, stats from CoreLogic on vacancy rates sorry, not vacancy rates, on um, rental yields around the country at the moment. And these are your capital cities, um, you know, houses and units. Now, it's not uncommon for us in some of these regional areas to be getting over 6% in, in, as a rental yield. And it's because we can when float around that, um, that sweet spot of the 450 to 600, we can often get um, 450 to 600 in rent as well. So that sweet spot in, um, in, the, um, in the rental market is extremely important. Um, a couple of areas that we've talked about in the past, here, which I'll quickly fly through, uh, and you've mentioned a couple of them already, but we started, when we first started looking at regional areas, one of the first areas we looked at was Ge um, Geelong. And the reason for that, we go back to that PIED checklist, the population was exploding because of the affordability in the lifestyle drivers. Um, obviously affordability being a much cheaper option than uh, the capital city of Melbourne, lifestyle being 15 minutes away from the, the Great Ocean Road, and just being able to have the nice country air and great school education and things like that. The infrastructure boom, we obviously had the regional rail link that opened in 2015, which was the, um, the V-line service running from Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo into the capital city of Melbourne. Um, still work on that now. It's going to bring it online with the Tullamarine Airport as well. So people that have bought in Geelong will continue to see some really growth, uh, great growth there. The, um, the number one employer down in uh, Geelong when we first started looking there was Barwon Health. So health sector being a really big employer of the area, education with Deakin University, a lot of great public and private schools. And then um, the other big factor was that the um, state government um, uh, repurposed a lot of the um, public service um, roles. So public sector jobs like WorkSafe, NDIS, um, TAC, and all those into these regional areas as well. So when we first started selling in Geelong, this is actually one of the first packages I sold back in 2014. Um, we sold that package for 376,000. Um, that property is now valued about 640,000. So um, that was a probably, you know, call that a little bit of a wait for um, maybe three, four month wait for titles and a six month build. We're probably 2015 by the time we've completed that property. Um, $360 a week uh, up to $450 and we're looking at 70% growth, um, which is um, capital growth of $263,000 in a pretty short time frame. Um, today, if you were to go and buy in the same um, estate of Warra Lily, um, you that same block we paid $179,000 for is selling to $365. Um, and then you still wouldn't be able to build on it until 2023. So this, the reason I use this slide is to talk to you about, um, you know, it's not just about price, it's about timing and what these things um, can mean for when you're actually gonna get your property as well, because Victoria right now, uh, off the back of all the stimulus last year, very, very hard to find um, title land in these uh, regional areas. So that's another consideration that um, investors should be considering when they're looking at um, their next move. Um, from there, we went on to the Ballarat market. And that's because um, if we go back to that rental pyramid, we saw um, long prices really taper up. They started to get to that 550, 560 uh, mark for the same type of uh, property. And of course, the rent hadn't quite kept the same. We see that capital growth far exceeds 
uh, rent because of income. We're not getting these huge pay rises, unfortunately. So we're not seeing rental income, you know, drive up anywhere near as quickly as growth in a lot of occasions. So that did mean for my investors entering the market sort of 2015-16, that Geelong probably wasn't our best option at that point. We'd got in there nice and early, clients have made significant money in there and they did. But Ballarat represented the similar story. So we had regional rail link again, um, $460 million redevelopment of the hospital there. We had a lot of public sector jobs at the $100 million redevelopment of the GovHub building. Uh, so that houses the state revenue office and another thousand um, uh, government sector jobs. So Ballarat market, first property I sold down there, 2016, 299,000. Uh, that property today is worth about 540, which is 80% growth, 240,000 again in, um, in capital growth. And ironically, that doesn't seem like all that long ago. I feel like uh, an old man um, you know, um, talking to somebody saying this is what property prices used to be back then. It wasn't all that long ago, but that same price of uh, 299 that I sold a house for, uh, four bedroom home on a block of land, the exact same um, block size now, the land itself is worth 299,000. So in five years, what used to be able to buy a house and land package, you're just getting a block of land now. Um, and obviously that, there's a number of things um, um, that, you know, are driving that, not just your, your capital growth, but obviously construction prices going through the roof in the last 12 months as well. So from there, we moved on to the Sunshine Coast. Sunshine Coast telling a very similar story, you know, uh, huge infrastructure boom, massive um, new CBD getting created at Maroochydore. Um, the Batinia market there is one of the most uh, successful uh, markets I've seen in a long time. Uh, off the back of a really big um, uh, $1.8 billion new hospital there. We also have the, in um, uh, in the Sunshine Coast is the fastest growing university in Australia, the University of the Sunshine Coast, and then obviously the airport at um, Maroochydore also went international as well. So huge story for the Sunshine Coast. I, that was one of the ones that I would say has probably been the best performer we've seen in a long time. Um, 2019 selling packages there, 497, jumped up to 600 very quickly, but renting at $650 a week. So it's a, a, an incredible story. Um, the Sunshine Coast, not only from a growth perspective, but how quickly their, um, their yields have uh, increased as well. Um, I know at the moment, if you were to try to buy something um, at uh, the Sunshine Coast, you'd certainly be paying a hell of a lot more, but the land um, sizes have come uh, in a long way as well. So I guess the next question that most people will be asking is where to next? Um, and, and in line with the, the topic of today's conversation, you know, do we expect these trends to continue? And I certainly um, do tell know what your thoughts on, on that are, but this, um, you know, this push for people to get into more affordable housing and living in a different way, there's certainly been that push that's happened throughout COVID, but we certainly believe that we'll continue to see that for years to come. Yeah, I mean, uh... I, I certainly do. I think it's a trend that's got longevity. Um, it, it's been underway for some time. It's fundamentally driven by the, the pursuit of lifestyle at affordable prices and the ability to work remotely. So it's about technology. It's been given greater impetus by the pandemic, certainly, but it's not fundamentally about that. So I think it, it's just going to roll on. And um, um, so, some of the areas that are now, now emerging as alternatives, the, the ones that you have... Um, have articulated there, uh, Geelong, Ballarat, they, they were certainly be the beginnings of that trend, but now we've seen in, in Victoria, it's moved to other, like a Bendigo is one that's um, got on board with that very, very strongly. Um, the, the, the towns of the Latrobe Valley, and it's, and it's spread further and further widely. Um, and in Queensland, um, which is um, one of the strongest emerging markets in the country now, regional Queensland, um, Certainly beyond the Sunshine Coast, we have other markets emerging very strongly and parts of the Brisbane market as well being yeah. targeted. I think one of the things I'd like um, for any of the listeners out there uh, today to, to think about as well is that, you know, these things, these markets move very quickly. And uh, I do find a lot of people, um, you know, are talking about Brisbane and they're talking about markets like your Geelongs and Ballarats today. When um, the reason I go through and I show these slides is to talk about when we were targeting them. Okay, so it, it's very, very um, good and, and, and well to hear about a good property market. But a lot of the time, if you're hearing about a good property market from a friend, a relative, or a, you know, certainly in the media, you could be too late. And these things, I, I can tell you, we, we targeted the, the Toowoomba area um, maybe only three or four months ago. And again, off the back of a really big infrastructure boom, we're almost done there. There's literally no land left. 
It's um, if you speak to a, a real estate agent in Toowoomba today, they'll tell you they've never seen a market like it. And um, again, it's a really big infrastructure play with the you know the um, inland rail link opening up um, you know in the next couple of years. That's a train line going from Melbourne all the way through to Brisbane via Toowoomba. Um, Boeing's just um, invested a, or uh, signed a deal to do a billion dollar um, aerospace project at the Wellcamp uh, Airport there. There's a 70 million dollar Qantas uh, training facility, huge infrastructure stuff, but they just don't have the, the, the land there uh, at the moment. And there's literally a handful of states. Um, there's a one man uh, called Brad the Landman who controls most of the land estates there. And you know, he sends out um, you know, his prices on a weekly basis. And it's incredible to see how quickly that's moving. Um, and a lot of the estates that are actually on his list aren't even in Toowoomba themselves or in little satellite um, uh, townships just outside of it. But the reason I bring that up is because it's very important that the, your decisions around where you're going to invest today, you know, are current data. You know, these trends that we're talking about, and I'm not going to leave everybody on and say where to next and not tell you, but we, um, we've been focusing on Toowoomba and it's, it's amazing how quickly we've had to move out of there because it's, no, uh, it's, it's not representing the value that we saw there a few months ago purely because prices are going up, scarcity of land is driving up the prices, and now it's got to the point where in order for us to hit our yield and try to find that place where we can get into the budget for 50 to 600, again, we've got to move. So there's areas, sorry, you were going to... I was going to say, uh, make two points about Toowoomba as a great case study. The first one is, um, is, is part of your, your pride formula, um, the importance of infrastructure. Uh, Toowoomba has become such an important city because of um, uh, there's, there's a big infrastructure spend there and it's ongoing, but two pieces of infrastructure in particular, the Wellcamp Airport mm -hmm. and the Inland Rail Link, and suddenly it, it becomes a player of, of national importance. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Boeing. Boeing's never actually constructed it aircraft outside of North America before it's now yeah. for the first, first time, time doing it it's doing it in yeah. Toowoomba no, and that would not be happening were it not for the inland rail link and the new world camp airport so suddenly Toowoomba becomes a very important city because of those very important pieces of infrastructure and their importance actually far exceeds the, the actual the amount of the investment in creating those pieces of infrastructure and the other point I think comes out of what you've just said about Toowoomba is that um, I always believe that um, people if they're wanting to um, invest in real estate, they should always get um, a professionals on board their team, uh, our buyer's agent, other advisors, be willing to um, spend some money on that. Um, but I think now more than ever than before, people do need that on board because it's extremely hard for people, particularly those starting out, to operate in a climate like this where markets are so strong and competitive and things are selling so quickly. You really do need professionals on your team helping you through that. Absolutely. Look, for, for me, I operate as a buyer's advocate for both um, new and uh, established properties. And um, I can tell you now, it's not just about, you know, trying to find the right market. A buyer's advocate and a good buyer's advocate will not only help you from, you know, identifying the right locations, helping you negotiate, but every state, if you're looking at the stat that I brought up before, 44% of people are open to investing in a state opposite to the one that they live in, so not in the same state. The laws that you're familiar with in real estate differ in every state. So there's a lot of different tips and tricks that a, a good buyer's advocate can help you with when you're negotiating on property interstate. It's a very, very important factor. Yeah. And Dilip has just um, uh, put a comment into the chat box, and I do encourage all of you to put your, your comments and your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A panel because we, there will be an opportunity for us to uh, answer your questions. Commenting that uh, Twum is going to host uh, some of the Olympic events in 2032. And that's also something that's uh, is going to bring increased focus on Toowoomba. Yeah. Uh, the 2032 Olympics isn't just about Brisbane. It's very much about the Sunshine Coast. It's about the Gold Coast. It's about Toowoomba and also some of the, the northern cities uh, like Townsville as well. So that's also a point well made. And he's had I'd, um, I'd say on that as well, um, Terry, that you know, there's so much talk around the, the uh, Brisbane Olympics, and I think it's a, a huge thing for Brisbane. Um, let's also keep in mind, though, that you won't be the first person. If you're thinking about buying in Brisbane right now, there's a lot of other people doing it at the same time. So it is really um, important to think about that because you are going to be buying in a, you know, a hot market. And um, I do, you know, as much I love Brisbane and we've been a big supporter of Brisbane, I think, I'd say 70% of our sales this year have been in Queensland, but not specifically Brisbane itself. I think there's some really good value outside of Brisbane. 
Okay, so Southeast Queensland is a big place. There are some really good pockets. I love the, you know, I've been a big fan of the Springfield region. I love Toowoomba, um, Sunshine Coast, even as high as your poon now, um, you know, outside of Rockhampton. There are some really good markets that will still benefit from the Olympics, but you don't have to be specifically in Brisbane. Yeah. So it would now be a time to, to focus now on some of the places you think are the trending places that people might uh, be considering as alternatives to the ones we've already talked about that are, um, you know, well advanced in their cycle. Yeah, look, I think, um, again, if we were to talk about the, the, the property clock, um, I'm, and I'm going to um, go back to the, the story of Springfield for a second, because again, this is something that I think um, anybody listening should uh, focus on is that it's not so much about um, you know, finding just a great area and saying um, you know, there's great plans in place, there's going to be all this infrastructure. You want to start to see some data trends to say, okay, I'm seeing median prices increase, I'm seeing vacancy rates drop. Vacancy rates are an incredibly good lead indicator or, um, you know, for, for, uh, or um, uh, future-proofing what your investment looks like. If you've got really low vacancy rates, it means people want to live there. Yeah, there mustn't be a heap of investors. You've got really, really good demand. So these are the types of trends that you can see on free websites uh, in Australia. So write this one down, guys. SQM Research. It's a free website. Jump on there. You can put in any postcode and it's pretty much live data. And the reason being, um, you know, the way that they draw all of that is because they can look at um, how many um, units or how many houses within the suburb, how many of them are actually uh, advertised for rent on realestate.com, domain, et cetera. So it's a really good tip. Grab down that uh, website, use it because these vacancy rates are a really good lead indicator on what to expect moving forward. Medium price growth. A lot of the time, you don't see those trends released from CoreLogic, a true indication until maybe three, four months later. And a lot of the time, medium price growth can be really misleading as well. So I don't believe it's a great one to follow. Vacancy rates, in my opinion, is a good one. So um, one of the first areas that we would talk about, and we probably only have time for one today, but an area that I think is um, is showing um, great potential, as, and it's ironic I'm chatting with you, um, you about this, Terry, because you've been a big fan of Adelaide for a long time. Um, but for me, we, we always look at, you know, there's markets everywhere uh, that are cyclical. For me at the moment, I believe that Adelaide is at the right time to be jumping in. Um, some incredible, incredible infrastructure projects happening there. Um, really incredibly diverse. I mean, they're talking about, um, you know, Adelaide being the next Silicon Valley. Um, so I'll jump in the slide deck that I've got on here. Um, there's a lot of text on it. So I don't think we'll, um, we'll go through it all today, Terry, but I'm more than happy to share this slide deck with, um, with anybody that wants it. So I'll leave my details up at the end if anyone would like to get a copy of it, but really high, um, high level. Adelaide, third, uh, third most livable city in the world. Um, the increase in South Australian migration, which is what we talked about at the start of today's chat, it's the strongest it's been in 30 years. Okay, so this is off the back of a big job boom and infrastructure boom. So uh, here's a, a list of some of the uh, infrastructure plans that are on there. There's a $12.9 billion infrastructure spend, which is going to create 80,000 construction jobs. So Adelaide Convention Centre, 397 million, Adelaide's North South Corridor, the former Adelaide Hospital, Greenways and Bike Boulevards, Granite Island Cause Pro, uh, Causeway Project, Globelink, Riverbank Entertainment Precinct, uh, and a really big re revitalization um, project as well. The big thing with um, that we've actually avoided in uh, a lot of the areas that we've looked at in the past are mining areas. And it's mainly because, you know, that's what the number one thing that's been driving the area is. It's ironic that, um, you know, we've always said to people, look, try to avoid the mining areas where you can, mainly because it does represent some level of risk. The, um, the thing that I love about Adelaide is we're looking at mining as a really strong thing for this area because it's not only that we're going there for mining, it's one element of why we're going there. Um, a lot of people probably don't think about South Australia when they think about mining. They're probably typically thinking of WA and Queensland, but South Australia is a really big player in, in mining. The, um, you know, the uh, Olympic Dam is actually the largest open cut uh, mine in the world. Um, you know, we're doing um, uh, a lot of copper out of South Australia now. A lot of this stuff is becoming really, really um, big on the agenda for um, uh, investors from overseas because they're seeing the amount of copper and, and uh, uranium that we're uh, pulling out of the ground in South Australia. And a lot of this is on the uplift because of all of these electronic vehicles. Okay, so there's a huge, huge demand for lithium and uranium and, uh, and copper. So really big uh, uh, tip there for South Australia is look at it for its infrastructure in, in uh, mining over the next couple of years because it will expand. Um, yeah, a couple of news articles on, um, on um, Adelaide at the moment as well. So new train station, we've got um, 
you know, this slide here gives you a little bit more depth on the hospital as well. So a $1.8 billion new women's and children's hospital coming to Adelaide. And then another really big one is that we've, um, we've secured uh, three huge multi-billion dollar submarine contracts uh, for Adelaide as well. So defence plays a really big um, a part in Adelaide's future, future growth. Um, for us, when we, when we think about um, uh, any investment area, it does need to have all that infrastructure. We do need to see population growing. But the thing that Adelaide stands out to us for is its diversification within the employment sector. And um, last but not least, price. <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've got packages in, um, in um, South Australia and Adelaide, you know, they've got a three in front of it. So you can be still buying good value in Adelaide for under 400,000. You'll get dollar per thousand in rent. Um, and I'm pretty sure, Terry, you'd agree, as far as vacancy rates are concerned, I don't think you could pick a postcode in South in Adelaide itself. It's a greater metro area that's got vacancy rates over 1%. Yeah, no, I agree entirely um, with everything you've said about um, about Adelaide, uh, vacancy rates. I mean, vacancy rates are low, it, ultra low in most parts of Australia, but probably more so in Adelaide than every, everywhere else. Yeah. Um, I don't think there is a single postcode in Adelaide with a, a vacancy rate as high as 1%, most of them are closer to zero than 1%. Um, and it's um, making a very strong um, rental market, a great place to be a landlord. One of the other things about Adelaide that I think is worth mentioning, and what I really love about it, is that it's become, in effect, the Silicon Valley of Australia. It's very much the high-tech innovation capital of the country um, for uh, alternative energy, which is becoming increasingly important, but also in, in other areas. Um, it's got some a number of notable innovation precincts. And I think it's significant that some very, very major world enterprises that have established in Australia, have set up the headquarters in Adelaide, not in Sydney or Melbourne, like Elon Musk with his Tesla battery. You know, and what is he, second or third richest man in the world? Yeah. Um, he set up his um, Australian operation in Adelaide because it's got that growing reputation for being the place to be when you're in that space. Yeah. Um, there's a whole lot of other examples. Technicolor has been involved in the making of movies mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Um, their Australian headquarters is Adelaide as well, and many other examples. So let's not forget the terrific wine they produce. <laughs> exactly as well. Um, but I think, you know, given that the world increasingly is driven by technology and our federal government is putting its, its, its faith in dealing with climate change and emissions in tech, uh, technology driven uh, response, um, Adelaide becomes just increasingly important. And given the value for money that it offers and the incredibly low vacancy rates, I just think the time is right for people to target that city, yeah. as you quite correctly point out. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, look, we've got um, a, a growing number of um, questions and um, comments coming in. Um, just before we go to those um, and talking about Adelaide, are there any particular parts of Adelaide that you're targeting with uh, your research at the moment? Look, it's a there's, there's, we, we have been doing a little bit out in the, the northern area, but the first thing I would say is we're not really the type of business that has, we don't operate off a stock list or anything like that. The first thing I would say, people, is we really want to understand their circumstances first. Adelaide might not be where we'd recommend. Really want to look at what they've got first. Um, so when we typically meet with a client for the first time, we do just a discovery meeting, find out, you know, what are your goals? What, what are actually um, do you own already? Uh, what's your budget? Have you got a pre-approval? All these different types of things before we'd start to be recommending anything. So look, um, I, I always think that if you're um, looking to invest in property, don't start with property. It sounds very strange, but you know, so many people get it around the wrong way. We really want to look at what you've got um, to begin with to make sure where, what we're talking about um, you know, today is going to be suitable for you because you know, most, most clients have got, um, you know, what they sell to that person is going to be very different to that one. So I would say the Northern Pockets have been where uh, a lot of our you know, first time investors uh, and second time investors have been buying or people that are looking you know, for something outside of um, Queensland because they might already have a property property or two there. So it's giving uh, a really good diverse, um, diversity place so that you don't have all your investments in one basket. But um, there's certainly some pockets all over and, and that'll treat different budgets as well throughout LA. That's an incredibly important point. In the various forums that I do, including this one, I get asked a lot of questions and a lot of people ask questions and they think that there's a correct answer to that question. Where's yeah. the best place to buy right now? Where's the best place to go for capital gains? Where should I be buying? And what people tend not to understand is that the answer actually can be different for, for everyone. If you ask 
the same question of 12 different people, there might be 12 different answers depending on their circumstances, what they already own, what their objectives are, what their uh, price range is, how much they can afford to buy and all of that. And I think that's um, part and parcel of what you do for individual clients at Reventon. I think um, a good example of that, Terry, I had a client last week who uh, were based in the Gold Coast. They've been wanting to invest in um, property for some time, but you know, for one reason or another, things always got in the way. And they say life happens as you're planning it. Uh, so they hadn't got around to it, but they, um, they decided it was time to you know, bite the bullet. And um, they were really surprised with how in-depth the discovery meeting went into what their goals would be, because they thought they were just going to say, we want to buy an investment property, where do we buy? But um, for them, it's really about identifying what their life looks like in the next five years. They were originally going to be looking at something um, near to them in the Gold Coast, and they were prepared to spend about 800000 And um, we're like, you told us five, uh, five minutes ago that you're also wanting to build your dream home. And the dream home had a, a, um, a shelf life of five years uh, before they wanted to do it. I said, if you buy that $800,000 property today, even if it jumps up over you know, 1.2 in the next couple of years, because it's your uh, investment, and you're going to have that in, uh, interest only, you're still going to own 800000 on it. So um, the reason I give, give that example is because without the right advice and understanding um, you know, parts of your goals, um, it's really, really difficult and can be very dangerous buying something just for the sake of buying something because it, it could prohibit what those future goals um, uh, look like. And, you know, the last thing you want to be doing is just saying, here, buy this property, and then you come back to us in two years' time and say, but I want to be able to buy that house over there as well, and you can't. So really good example um, of that client. They end up buying in Toowoomba. Um, it turns out where they really wanted to end up uh, in a couple of years' time as their dream home, they're now going to go and rent that, and they're turning their own home into an investment. So they've gone from having just one property, they've now got two investment properties and renting elsewhere as a rent investor because they want to be closer to the beach and it actually means they're actually, um, uh, they're actually making uh, money out of both properties, the one in Toowoomba as well as their Gold Coast property. That's helping contribute to their rent near to the beach where their kids want to be. So that's the type of story that um, you know, people should be thinking about because it's not just about going, hey, I can, I've got a budget of $600,000, let us go and buy something. Yeah, and, and just developing that point and also referring back to one of your earlier points, the importance of, of a good rental yield. I think what people um, perhaps don't appreciate is that if you buy an like $800,000 property, you're almost certainly going to have a low rental yield yeah. and it will be negative again. It's actually costing you money to own it. When you go back to the bank for the next property, they're going to be perhaps less um, enthusiastic about lending to you in those circumstances. Whereas if you've got um, your initial purchases with properties with high yields, which means they're probably going to be positive cash flow, it's going to be easier to go back to the, to the bank and get uh, finance for the next property. I think that's very much part of the philosophy. Yeah, look, I know you've got some questions to get to, but I'll uh, make one more comment on the, the higher yields. And, and um, a lot of people see, you know, Facebook advertising and they'll say, hey, you can get this, you know, 12% yield or a 20% this, 20% that. I'd, I'd like to point out to people that anytime you are um, you know, looking for something that's giving you that higher yield or the higher growth, you're typically going to have a higher risk. Okay, And the other part is anytime you're trading, uh, you're going for something higher, whether it is growth or, um, or, or yield, you're probably going to trade off on the opposite. So if you're chasing high yield, you might not get good growth. If you're chasing high growth, you might not get good yield. I believe that there's a really good median in both of those. And an example of that, um, not that I've got anything against dual keys or NDIS or anything, but they do typically get the higher rental yields. When you think about selling that property in a few years' time, who do you think is going to be buying that property? It's probably going to be an investor because an NDIS property is not going to go to an owner-op. A, a dual lock, maybe an owner-op buy on one side, but typically they're going to appeal to investors because of that higher rental yield. So in years to come, when you decide that you want to sell that property, you'd want to hope there's investors in the market and also be prepared that they're probably going to want the best price possible. So there is a median in, um, in this, in my view, and, and everybody has their own view on, on which way to go, but I do believe that there's a really good sweet spot when it comes to growth and yield. Regional um, cities tend to give that, and I, you know, I like to build a good investment home, not a cheap, nasty investment just to get the, the price down, but um, buying something and putting in the right amenities you know, that are going to give you good resale in the future. That'll give you good rental yield and good growth. Yeah, but I totally endorse that, Tim. I think it is possible to have um, the best of all worlds if yeah. you choose your location well and understand the dynamics and property markets, buying in a good uh, regional centre with a high yield, um, but but has the all those qualities you've talked about, um, growing population, diverse and strong economy, creating employment, you've also got great potential. 
for capital growth. Um, let's turn to some of the, um, the questions and comments that have been coming in while we've been talking. Um, and here's one from Peter, which um, perhaps uh, speaks to your earlier comments about you know, buying at the right time in the cycle. He's asking whether there's any growth left in Ballarat or has it had its run? I think it's had its run. So there, I typically find, um, and I don't want to um, make this sound like a negative thing about the um, regional areas, but there is typically a bit of a glass ceiling in these areas as well. Okay, when I what I mean by that is income growth. We don't typically find, and maybe we're going to start to see some of these trends of, um, you know, higher income in these now that people can work from home. But typically, we don't see those uh, those areas having um, a really high income, and we've already seen such huge growth in Ballarat over the last couple of years, like double digit growth the last three years in a row. Um, I it's I still love the area, um, and um, you know, I, I think if you I, I just change the product a little bit too. It might be a renovators um, play there. Buying something new there's a little bit more of a struggle now because the land prices have gone through the roof. You've got huge um, title delays uh, in a lot of areas as well. So I do think that there's much better value elsewhere. Yeah, you know, I totally endorse that. I think people should be looking for places that have similar qualities and the potential to yeah. do what Ballarat has done for, for the last, say, four years, but a little bit earlier in the cycle. It's, um, and I'd say, Peter, I, um, I, on the subject of Ballarat, so many of my clients made uh, money in Ballarat that I actually, when I started looking at Toowoomba, because a lot of my clients that um, did buy in Ballarat were actually from Melbourne. So when I was showing them Toowoomba, it was a little bit of a scratch the head. You know, it seems so far away from, from Brisbane. So it was a, um, a hard thing for some people to get their head around. And I actually created a document called Compare the Pet. And I was comparing Ballarat to Melbourne and, and Toowoomba to Brisbane. It's uncanny how similar they are. Travel time, population side, infrastructure, the, um, the local economy, what's driving it. Same four major industries driving the local economy. So use Ballarat and say, I say success leaves hints. Why did Ballarat grow from here to here? What was driving it? It's that pied theory. If you go and find that pied theory in other areas, you're on door winner. Yeah. And when you've got that new airport and the inland rail link um, heading your way, um, it's almost a case of distance from the capital city becomes irrelevant because it has that such powerful forces. That's right. Um, let's see, Maria asking about um, the, the northern areas of Brisbane heading up towards the Sunshine Coast. Is anything there that can be, can be considered to be near major employment hubs. Do you have any thoughts about that part of Brisbane? Yeah, the um, the pocket between sort of North Lakes up to the Sunshine Coast through the Moreton Bay region there is quite exciting with um, you know, what's happening around Caboolture um, and obviously the new um, marina that's happening there. So there's a big um, job creation um, going through there. One thing that I will say is probably um, relevant for you at the moment, though, is do keep in mind that it's still part of Brisbane. And um, I do believe that a lot of Brisbane is probably in that, I, don't know, I have to say this, but probably a little bit overpriced for, for what you're getting at the moment, only because they've had um, you know, such a huge influx that I, I do think that land developers there are, you know, probably edged up a little bit too quickly. That's, that's yeah. all I'd say. It probably value for money on where it was 12 months ago, very different. It's still an exciting market, but just be careful on, on how much you pay. And one of the other factors in that region you mentioned, the Morton Bay region, the north, the, the new university campus, which hasn't yet been able to function normally, but ultimately it's going to have 10,000 students going there. It's going to be yeah. a major generator. Um, Tim is asking about um, Yapoon, which is uh, coastal Queensland, central Queensland. Um, we, we tend to regard it as the, the outer seaside suburb of Rockhampton, which is a, a regional city that we like quite a bit. Um, how do you feel about that one, Tim? Yeah, we've been um, we've been doing uh, a few sales in in Yapoon for our clients recently. Incredibly strong rental yields. Um, it's obviously you know coastal um, area as well. They're calling it the next Byron Bay. I don't know who they are, but it is um, certainly an area that is um, picking up a lot of migration. Um, I've had a lot of people that um, I know in you know, property space in the Gold Coast. You know that have been selling their you know properties at the Gold Coast for record prices, and I ask the question, where where are the people that are selling in the Gold Coast yeah. going? And everyone says you poon. So yeah. it's um you know it, it's probably a smaller population um, base than what we would usually target, but you're 30 minutes away um, by train to to Rockhampton, you know, and an easy drive to, to Rockhampton as well to a major uh, city as well. You get really big uh, incomes uh, that are, are residing there as well. There's still a lot of fly in, fly out work that happens out of uh, Rockhampton. And yeah. I think you know again touching on the mining side of things, 
Um, I think mining people people have been probably been burnt in the mining areas in the past and probably looking at that uh, as a, a negative. But I do see the mining up there um, actually being a positive at the moment. Still want to make sure you're not paying too much. You're getting a good rental and you're not buying it because of mining. Your poon has the best of both. So you've got that lifestyle play, affordability play, incredibly strong rental yields. Like you, you'll get, you know, over a dollar per thousand in that region. And uh, Rockhampton does have a very, very big infrastructure spend underway, some uh, particularly transport infrastructure. That's another driver there. Um, uh, one of the points you just made, and it speaks to the general theme today, which is what's the longevity of this trend? One of the things that we're noticing, uh, which you just touched on, is this kind of a ripple effect happening with this trend. Someone will sell in Melbourne and buy on the Gold Coast. The people who sell to them on the Gold Coast are moving somewhere. And quite often, as you say, they're moving to somewhere like Yapoon. Another uh, target area for, for that is, is Harvey Bay, um, the Fraser Coast region. So kind of um, there's it's a series of people selling for a price and then buying somewhere else a comparable property for half the price and having money left over. So it's just sort of rippling up the coast of Queensland to a certain degree. There's that, but there's, um, you know, a big, big player in that is not just um, people are thinking about this migration as, um, you know, people, you know, that are you know, still in the workforce. There's a lot that are leaving the workforce with this ageing population. I can tell you, Yapoon's got a uh, an estate up there um, just outside of the state, uh, golf course estate, stunning location where they're actually building quite unique um, developments now, which are quite high yielding as well, where um, you, know, you might have four elderly singles that are living in the same house. Every one of these homes are designed with a, an ensuite and walking robe and everything like that. So they've got their own private um, living arrangements, but they've got shared uh, kitchen facilities, living um, uh, you know, living areas and things like that. And they're actually managed as one investment, but it means that they've still got the ability to, you know, live in, um, you know, with other people without having to be living in a retirement home, so to speak. So there's a big push for, um, you know, the, the Yapoon market for a lot of people that don't want the hustle and bustle of the Gold Coast for the Sunshine Coast and want that more relaxed lifestyle up at Yapoon. Yeah. Um, a number of people just asked again for that um, that website you mentioned earlier. You're referring to SQM Research. SQM Research. I have to say, there's a couple of websites that I have open permanently on my um, my de my desktop computer mm -hmm. that, because I refer to them so much, and yeah. the SQM Research is is one of those um, for vacancy rates, but a whole lot of other data yeah. that's useful for our research, um, which is freely available. It's it's, it's a great resource. Okay. Um, Referencing um, Northern Adelaide, we discussed earlier, and Chris is asking um, or commenting that he believes that Gawler is exceptional, but I would tend to agree. Yeah. It's certainly in our reports at the moment. Have you looked at that market? It's a little bit further north um, than when, where we are. We're sort of that Manaparo, Blakeview um, location because it is a little bit closer to the, um, to the infrastructure. Now, in saying that, nothing wrong with Gawler. Uh, I just I haven't actually done much in it yet. Yeah, we like it um, for a number of reasons, affordability, um, improved transport links, but also it's the kind of the gateway to the Barossa Valley oh, wine district. So it's got that lifestyle element that's yeah, very much um, part of this trend. Um, I think asking, if, you lived in, if you lived in Adelaide, uh, for an investor, they think they would uh, see value in, uh, in Gula like we do here, seeing value in Geelong or Ballarat in the past. Um, but for an interstate investor, again, that mindset when we're looking on a map, we go Gawler there, Adelaide uh, CBD there. We've got to get out of that mindset. But for a lot of my clients, they sort of see that they're, um, you know, I can get into Manapara or um, Blakeview. They, they can just see that there's a lot more already there. So mm -hmm. nothing wrong with Gawler whatsoever. But for a lot of investors, they'd like to be a little bit closer in. Yeah. Darren's asking about man, Gambia, Mount Gambia. Does it fit in this area for Adelaide? I think so some distance from Adelaide. In fact, it's right at the border with um, Victoria. Do you have any thoughts on Mount Gambia? Yeah, it's certainly um, an up and coming area uh, as well. It sort of get, get through the Southern Hills to, uh, to get through there. So there's a bit of a gap between Adelaide and Mount Gambia, but certainly you know, it represents good value for money again. Okay. Um, Dylan's asking about um, apartments uh, in the Gold Coast area. It's probably not a market that you'd be. Um, we, I'm settling a. Um, I had a client that bought um, their uh, bought an apartment on Chevron Island. There, um, got right at the start of the pandemic. Um, he bought a two bedroom apartment that sort of looks back towards Surface Paradise. Paid six fifty for a uh, a two bedroom, two bathroom, huge balcony. Um, I think you'll settle with about two hundred thousand worth of equity in it. 
Gold Coast market, both in rental yield, um, low vacancy rate and growth. It's um, between Gold Coast and Canberra. They're probably the two markets that we uh, do look at when people do want apartments. Um, and again, this comes back to what I was talking about before. There isn't a one size fits all with everybody. Apartments, a lot of people shy away from and say, oh, you can't make money in apartments. You certainly can. Um, you've got to be you know, um, picky about what you want. It's got to have something different. It's got to have a nice aspect. It's got to have something so it's not any, uh, It's a bit more individual than anything else that's in the project. Um, but certainly we don't have a big appetite for the cookie cutter approach. You know, that's um, you know, just at a price point. We can get good house and land packages for the same prices of apartments in capital cities by going to great regional areas. So that uh, works out to be a better play for most. But certainly um, Canberra and uh, the Gold Coast are great markets for people that do want um, an apartment in their portfolio. Yeah, I think the Gold Coast is a great example of the power of this, this trend we're talking about today, the access to affordable lifestyle. By all logic, the Gold Coast market should be struggling because you know the international borders have been closed, the yeah, tourists right. can't come in, that's what the whole economy is based on. And yet it's markets going off and it's buyers out of Sydney and Melbourne um, chasing that affordable lifestyle and prices are rising for both houses and apartments very strongly on the Gold Coast yeah. at the moment. Jane's asking about uh, North Queensland. What about North Queensland, Townsville in particular? Do you have a, have you had a look at Townsville? We haven't ventured that far. Um, it, it, put it this way, there isn't anything wrong with um, you know, those markets. It just hasn't been a big focus for us. We we do typically look for a, a decent sized population. We, we're looking at maybe 100,000. I know Townsville is a big place as well, but we're looking at least 100,000 as a population base typically before we start to uh, look at a lot of areas um, as a regional uh, centre. Um, I do think um, you could probably make some good money in Townsville. We just think um, that the areas that we've been focusing on with a population of 100,000 close to another CBD, um, nice and close, typically ticks the boxes. Um, but look, we can't be we can't be the experts on everywhere. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, uh, it's much for much. And so I think there'd be, you could pick any um, you know, coastal city around Queensland at the moment. And if they haven't experienced you know, price growth in the last 12 months, something's going wrong. Yeah, and Townsville's got this massive infrastructure spend in the works as mm. well. Um, the one the one thing about those markets that you need to be aware of is because of the, the weather events, the insurance yeah, premiums right. are so much higher, and that's a, something you keep in mind. Um, a number of people have asked about Perth because we've talked about Brisbane, we've yeah. particularly talked about Adelaide as one of those smaller capital cities. Um, have you spent uh, much um, time thinking about Perth, Tim? It's certainly on the radar for us uh, again. Like it's um, you know, obviously had its um, day in the sun many years ago and it's had some um, you know, not so fond years. It's certainly an emerging market again now. Um, I still do think that we've got better value outside of Perth, but it's certainly a market that you know, people can make money in. Well, um, I have a few people, including Dylan, asking about the Hunter region. And there's a, a, a region with lifestyle, affordability, proximity to major cities. Um, what are your thoughts there, Tim? I think, um, like many areas at the moment, that, um, that the New South Wales, well, I'll be more specific, a lot of Sydney siders are getting out of the city. And um, you know, Gold Coast is certainly one that's been taking off because of that. The other one is the Hunter Valley. So regional uh, New South Wales, if you look at the price growth there over the last two quarters uh, alone, uh, I, I, I put this in the same commentary that I did with Brisbane before. Yes, it's a good area, but make sure that you're not overpaying. It's a very popular area at the moment. And um, obviously, the more eyes, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this um, call today that are turning up with uh, or putting bids in online at many areas at the moment. And they're sick of getting blown out of the water, um, but it's bound to happen in these areas. And I can say I've had the same thing myself. Um, but one thing I would say is any time that you're you know, looking to invest into an area, have your price set, don't go over it, especially as an investor of your own or occupy, it could be a bit different because you're buying with your eyes and your heart. But as an investor, you stick to your, your price that you're um, you know, going in at that represents value and don't budge higher than it. Um, and if you don't find it in the areas that you're looking, you might be a bit late. So try to find the next one. Yeah, so it may well be the most important point um, that uh, we've made today, Tim, because I think there's way too many people are getting caught up in that frenzy and the competition and the market and, and just going beyond their budget yeah. and perhaps going beyond local values to secure a property in the face of strong competition. Yeah. Um, I think it's a time where people need to exercise a little bit of patience and, again, have some professionals on your team to, to help you through the, the sort of markets that we're dealing in at the moment. 
That's right. I mean, we've got, as you know, professionals in this um, space, we've got access to you know, you know, desktop valuations, trends all over the country. So you know, anybody is on this, even if it's not one of the areas I've talked about today, if they wanted to you know, get some um, reports on areas and things like that, more than happy to, um, you know, for them to reach out and, and email me and I'm happy to do the reports in different suburbs and that. But there's so much data out there that you can actually, if you analyse it properly, um, properly, can tell you what you should be paying for a place. And um, you know, I must say in the established market space at the moment, in any of these areas, um, you know, properties are lasting two, three days on the market before you know they've, they've got a contract on them. So, um, and they're selling well over uh, reserve price. So, don't fall into the trap of going of that FOMO trap where you pay higher than you probably should. The reason being is that you're an investor and your investor should be uh, looking at the numbers. So, know your numbers, know exactly what you want. Uh, and if you don't get it in that area, look for the next one. All right. Um, we're just coming up for the hour and just before we wrap up and, and tell people how they can get in touch with you, uh, Tim, if they want, want to follow up, we might just uh, focus um, as, a, as a final question from the one from D Wong saying, uh, with organisations pushing for a return to office for work, do you see sea change and hill change markets, uh, their growth plateauing or even reversing? Because that's very much what we're talking about today. What's the yeah. longevity of this trend? Uh, look, I think that trend that I was just talking about of um, you know, places selling you know, way over reserve price and you know, the, the sheer volume of sales and high price sales will start to curb. I can't see um, them necessarily going backwards as a market, you know, on um, you know, seeing any negative growth uh, there, at least for the next 12 months. Um, I think if, there, if we're going to see any you know, trends nationally of, of that, you know, that bubble burst, so to speak, um, it's probably going to be 2023. I still expect to have strong growth throughout the next uh, 12 months. Um, but certainly, you know, those regional areas, you've got to keep in mind as well, they don't have the development approvals that we do in the city. You know, they're, they're, they're not building up like we are in the CBD. So you are always going to have a limited amount of properties that people can buy. And I think that's going to, um, you know, serve them well as far as um, price growth into the, you know, into the future. It might slow down a little bit, but I don't see it going backwards, um, you know, in, at least in most markets as a generalisation. Yeah, and I certainly think this, this trend is considerable longevity. It's actually been going on far longer than most people realise, and I think uh, the forces driving it will continue. It's about um, technology, it's about lifestyle, it's about affordability, and um, I think it's going to be a driving force in the market for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Tim, um, perhaps you could finish by just um, letting everybody know how they can uh, follow up and make contact if uh, they'd like to, to do that. Sure thing. So uh, I've got my email on the bottom left there, tim.graham at reventom.com.au. So anyone's welcome to do that. Also have a QR code on the screen there. If you did want to book in a free 30-minute um, you know, chat with me, simply put your camera on your phone onto the uh, QR code. I think everyone's pretty familiar with that, with the check-ins that we have to do these days. But that'll take you to a link to my calendar and anybody's welcome to throw in a 15-30-minute uh, you know, conversation in there. If you just wanted to have a chat around what your plans are, certainly no obligation to go to the next step. But more than happy to help. So, yeah. Thanks, Sherry. All right. Okay. Um, thanks, Tim. Thanks for a great presentation. And I really enjoyed the discussion. It's been great to get your perspective on all this because um, you know, we've certainly been a strong advocate of, um, of um, the smaller cities and uh, the regional areas for some time. Um, and it's very clear that you've done a lot of work on it. There's a lot of research uh, behind what you're doing at Rivington. Uh, it's been really great to get that perspective with the numbers that you've also got. And uh, I also like what you've been doing with the slides today with the technology. <laughs> <laughs> very very yeah, crafty. Well, um, yeah, we had 12 months in lockdown where we thought we might as well utilise this time. <laughs> so I do urge um, those of you watching today, if you've got uh, further questions, and we didn't get to answer all the questions that people put, put in, apologies for that, but we, we've run out of time. If you'd like to follow up and make contact with Tim and members of his team, I do urge you to do so. It, um, it doesn't uh, cost anything to have the discussion in the first instance, and I think it's a, a, good, a good step for people to make if they're considering uh, property investment. So thank you, Tim Graham from Reventon, and thank you for everyone for your participation, for your comments and questions. Um, everyone who's registered will receive a copy of the, the broadcast as well, and you'll be receiving that in the next 24 hours or so. So um, thank you once again, and Tim, let's do it again soon. Sounds good, Terry. Thanks so much. Appreciate okay. you having me. Okay, bye for now.